Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Blair. Blair is an oncology dietitian, and she is the oncology clinical nutrition coordinator here with Northside. Blair and I came up with this topic and kind of excited to set the record straight on a couple things, answer questions, and y'all join us today. So as I said, feel free to ask questions at the end, or if you're worried you're going to forget your question, feel free to put it in the chat and we will, all, we will circle back to it at the end. But thank you, Blair, for joining us. I'm so happy to have you here today with us. Thank you, Lauren. I'm so happy to be here today and welcome everybody. Uh, so glad that you joined us um, for this um, topic that is actually it's multiple topics that are can be a bit controversial. Um, but I want all of you to walk away just feeling a little bit more free with your nutrition, a little bit more relaxed based on your knowledge, because it's all science based, evidence based, um, because we do many of us have a lot of well-meaning families, friends, even physicians and nurses who provide uh, nutrition recommendations that are not backed by evidence. And so I hope that you all uh, lead this just again, just feeling a little bit more free and a little bit uh, more armed with knowledge um, going forward in your nutrition journey. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and share that presentation. Um, if you don't catch everything on these slides, do not worry. Lauren will be sending them out later as well. And as Lauren said, this is being recorded. So you can go back and um, if you happen to miss anything, you can go back and review. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, wonderful. All right. So again, my main objective for today is for you all to walk away um, armed with knowledge, but I also pulled four common nutrition questions that I get oftentimes as a dietitian and my team gets um, surrounding nutrition for cancer patients. Um, and these are just questions we get asked all the time. We get asked if sugar feeds cancer. We get asked if organic foods or conventional farmed foods are better. We get asked if, if, we can eat, if patients can eat soy foods. And also what type of diet should patients follow in efforts to reduce cancer risk? or recurrence. So number one, this is probably the hottest topic, the most controversial, does sugar feed cancer? So let's dive into this one. So first and foremost, I wanna just talk about what is sugar? Uh, when a dietitian hears that you've eliminated sugar from your diet, automatically red flags fly. Because when I hear sugar, I think about those complex carbohydrates, the, the dairy foods, the whole grains, beans, fruit, vegetables, because I know as a dietitian that all that breaks down into glucose and all of that breaks down into sugar. So when my patients may be saying, oh, well, I'm just trying to avoid cookies, cakes, um, so that sort of thing, you know, that, that's a different story. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But all of those things, all of the, the junky sugar, um, and then all of those complex carbohydrates break down into glucose. Now, here's the deal. All cells, including those cancer cells and healthy cells, use sugar or glucose for energy. So it's, there's a lot more to the story. And again, sugar comes from all carbohydrate containing foods. And so that's vegetables, fruits, your whole grains, your low fat dairy, your legumes, as well as the cookies, cakes, um, high fructose corn syrup, honey, those sorts of things as well. So our number one goal while you're on treatment as dietitians is to educate you to main, how to maintain that muscle mass, and that's by consuming adequate calories, adequate protein, and to prevent uh, weight loss. Or if you're overweight or obese, to only have a modest weight loss of one to two pounds a week and no more than that. Um, and so when I hear that a patient is cutting out an entire macronutrient, which carbohydrates, which break down into sugar, glucose, um, I get concerned because that can cause weight loss, and then patients may have to have breaks in treatment, or they may 
um, have to reduce that the amount of treatment that they're getting. And so they're not getting the full prescribed treatment by their physician. So that can be alarming. So again, we cannot control which cells are going to get that sugar for energy. Um, you can't decide whether you're going to send a sugar molecule to a healthy cell or a cancerous cell. And cancer is smart. So if we're not providing sugar through our diet, then our bodies are going to be forced to create sugar from fat and protein to meet the needs of all of our cells, those healthy cells and those cancerous cells. Um, so it is important to ingest glucose as this is our body's preferred source of fuel, your brain and your body. Um, creating that sugar or when we're not consuming enough carbohydrate, um, that can result in muscle loss. And so that can cause fatigue, weakness when your muscles break down and also a weakened immune system, which can be uh, really bad if you already have a compromised immune system. And so we need to remember that there is no particular reason why sugar feeds cancer cells any more than sugar feeds all cells. It is not more attracted to cancer cells, nothing like that. It's important that we rely on chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy to kill those cancer cells, not to eliminate a certain food from our diet. So what I don't want you to hear me say is to go out and eat a bucket of ice cream or a whole cake or anything like that. That is not what your dietitian is saying. Um, it is important that we do discuss a hormone called insulin. It is still a good idea to limit eating the simple sugar. So this is where I'm talking about your um, cakes, your high fructose corn syrup, your Coca-Cola, those sorts of things. Um, and instead choose those good complex carbohydrates. So when we eat a lot of the simple sugars, our bodies are gonna compensate by producing a lot of insulin. So insulin by definition and by function is a hormone that's made by your pancreas and their jobs include signaling sugar to enter a cell and also increasing storage of calories and fat. So it kind of acts like a key to a lock. So insulin functions by telling all cells to grow. And so that's both your healthy cells and your cancer cells. Um, and so it's not good when our body produces too much insulin. So our goal is to avoid excess insulin production. Okay. So we, it, you can do that simply by avoiding ingesting large amount of simple sugars or large amount of simple sugars by themselves. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. So again, how do we handle the situation? Again, do not avoid all carbohydrates. These are some of the most cancer fighting foods. And the best sources for healthy complex carbs are those fruits, vegetables, your whole grain, your beans, lentils, all the foods which appear to fight cancer best. So in that fiber, which is in all of these foods actually prevents the blood sugars from spiking. And so it's your blood sugar is going to be more like a slope instead of a mountain, if that uh, visual makes a little bit more sense to you. So we want to pair other food types with carbohydrates, and that's going to slow down digestion and prevent a spike in blood sugars. And so you want to pair your carbohydrate foods with protein, fat, and fiber. So for example, instead of having two pieces of fruit for a snack, you may want to pair that fruit with a small handful of nuts as the example that's used here on this slide. So those nuts are gonna have a healthy fat, protein and a fiber. So it's gonna slow down that digestion. Um, so is it okay to have cookies and cakes and ice cream and all those sorts of things? The answer is yes. Absolutely. Your nutrition is on a continuum. It's not if you eat a scoop of ice cream or have some fried food that you're just ruined. Um, it's what are you choosing most of the time? And it's best if you're going to have a piece of cake or have some a birthday party or have some ice cream, whatever the case is, try having that with your meal or right after your meal because there's a good chance that that meal is gonna have your protein, your fiber, your fat content. And so even though you are ingesting some of that simple sugar, your blood sugar is not gonna spike and that insulin is not gonna be uh, released to the extent that it would be had you just consumed that simple sugar on its own. Um, so complex carbohydrates are broken down into basic sugars before they're absorbed, 
But again, that digestive process is just going to slow down because of the fiber, the protein, and the fat. Um, another thing that's not on this slide is I get asked about a lot is juicing. Okay. So if you think of a piece of fruit and you think of fruit juice, the amount of insulin that your body produces after eating a piece of fruit is going to be much lower than just drinking a cup of fruit juice because in the process of juicing, your fi the fiber of the fruit is removed and that's not a good thing. So juice is going to cause your blood sugar to spike, whereas eating a piece of fruit containing that fiber is, is going to cause um, the blood sugar to go up a little bit more slowly. So we recommend eating um, whole fruits as opposed to juicing or juices. So something else that's important to remember um, is paying attention to your nutrition facts label. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about added sugars here. Um, so the definition of added sugars is sugar that does not occur naturally in a food. So for example, bananas and apples are, have that natural fructose, that natural sweetness um, that's already in that. Um, but added sugar is added to a product to enhance the flavor or as a preservative, and it does not automatically naturally occur in that product. Um, and so there's two ways that we add sugar to foods. Sometimes we do it ourselves. Uh, if you have coffee in the morning, adding some sugar, adding some honey to your tea, that is added sugar and we're doing that ourselves. Um, also, the other way is added by food man manufacturers to processed or prepared or packaged foods. Um, so 75% of packaged foods have added sugars and they're not always the foods that we think they're gonna be. Um, for example, I was looking at some crackers the other day and some cereals that did not taste sweet. However, in looking at that nutrition facts label, I noted that there was a lot of added sugar. And so anytime you buy any packaged foods, just make sure to be mindful of that nutrition facts label um, to see if there's added sugar. And the average American eats 22 teaspoons per day of added sugar, which adds up to an additional 70 pounds of added sugar per year. And this is actually twice the amount recommended by the, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Um, so they recommend that we limit our added sugars to no more than 10% of total calories. Um, so for following a 2000 calorie diet, then 200 calories from added sugar would be the upper limit. And there's four calories per gram of sugar or gram in a carbohydrate. And so the upper limit or the most, the highest amount of added sugar that any of us should be eating is 50 grams a day. Okay, so that's 12.5 teaspoons. Um, and again, as it says here in this statistic, we're eating 22 teaspoons, so about double. So if you'll, Put your attention on that new that nutrition facts label there on the right side of this of the slide, um, and go down to the circled portion. You'll see that that total sugar says 12 grams, but the added sugar only says 10 grams. So that all that means is that two grams of those sugars occurred naturally in that food product. Um, so this here happens to be yogurt, and I'm assuming that this is a flavored yogurt because it has 10 grams of added sugar, so it looks like that um, that, that was added in efforts to sweeten that yogurt even more. Um, so just be mindful of, of that, of the nutrition facts label, and that if you are consuming approximately a 2,000 calorie diet a day to, to consume no more than 50 grams as an upper limit, we should actually be consuming a lot less than that. Okay, so here's another one, another aspect of sugar feeding cancer is sugar and PET scans. And so patients, when they're taking their PrEP solution and they go in and have that PET scan, they see the glow on the screen. Um, it's not that that glucose is only reaching the cancer cells or those cells that light up. That's not what's showing. So what's showing on that PET scan is that hyperactivity or that hypermetabolism or higher metabolic rate of those cancer cells. That's what's being detected is the metabolism. They're just simply more active. They're not taking up sugar any differently. They're just dividing more rapidly. Um, the Mayo Clinic has done a lot of research on this. And I believe I included that in my resources at the end, if y'all are interested in, in learning a little bit more about that. 
Um, and they just say that cancer cells are just more active than healthy cells. But increasing sugar intake is not going to speed up that cancer cell growth. And decreasing sugar intake is not going to decrease your, your uh, cancer cell growth. So helpful comparison when considering that metabolism is our cells use sugar the same way that cars use gas. So those normal healthy cells use a reasonable amount of, we'll just call it gas or sugar, but those cancer cells are gas guzzlers, but they all use gas. So your healthy cells are going to be your Prius. Um, they're very fuel efficient and gas guzzlers are going to be your semi trucks. Um, during cell division, more glucose is going to be used, much like accelerating cars use more gas. But then after the division, it's going to go more back to an, an idling state using that less glucose. So cancer cells are like cars with the accelerator stuck to the floor and they use glucose at high rates because of the faster division. They divide faster than the normal cells. Um, this is why you're going through chemo, radiation, immunotherapy treatment is to stop the cells from dividing. Um, and we can't control which cells, once again, are getting the glucose. So sugar summary, I'm just driving this home because I've said it multiple times. Um, no food component, so no macronutrient, micronutrient, molecule, including sugar, can cause cancer by itself, nor can it protect you against cancer by itself. So we need a variety of those healthy foods in efforts to, to fight against cancer. Um, there's insufficient evidence to show a direct link between sugar intake and cancer growth. Avoiding sugar completely is not going to slow down that cancer growth. And eating a lot of, of simple sugar foods can mean excess calories to your diet, which leads to weight gain and excess body fat. So this is important because just merely having extra body fat, having extra fat on your body increases your risk for 11 types of cancer. And so that's why it's very important that we try to make efforts to attain a, a healthy weight. Um, and so that's one reason why we say you know, don't, don't eat a lot of uh, foods that are high in calories and not very nutrient dense. So that's the simple sugars. It's not that they feed cancer, it's that it contributes to obesity, which in turn can increase your risk for, for um, recurrence or for cancer itself. And there is strong evidence that a diet filled with a variety of plant foods um, can lower your risk for many cancers and increase overall health and immunity. Um, so that's not just cancer, but that's also decreasing your risk for heart disease, for diabetes, um, you know, things of that nature. So the only foods that the American Institute of Cancer Research say that can contribute to your risk of cancer is going to be your, um, your processed meats. So that's things like bacon and sausage, uh, lunch meats, things like that, and alcohol. So those are the things that need to be avoided or at least reduced. And then also just limiting your intake of red meat, which I'll discuss later on um, to 12 to 18 ounces a week. All right, so this is another one um, that we also hear is, do I have to eat organic food? Um, it, sometimes the question is phrased, can, am I allowed to eat organic food or am, am I allowed to eat conventional, um, con conventionally farmed foods? So just first, I just wanna com compare what is what. Um, conventionally farm foods apply chemical fertilizers to promote plant growth, whereas organic applies natural fertilizers. So they use like compost, manures um, to feed the soil and plants. And conventional insecticides are sprayed to reduce pests and disease, whereas in your organic crops, um, beneficial insects, birds, mating disruption or traps are used to reduce diseases and pests. pests. Conventionally farmed, farming uses different methods to manage weeds. They're gonna use herbicides as opposed to organic, which rotates the crops, tills, weeds, and mulches to manage those weeds. Um, conventionally farmed products may give animal antibiotics, growth hormones, and medications to prevent disease or spur growth. Um, whereas organic gives animals organic feed, outdoor access, and they do ro rotational grazing, they give the animals a balanced diet, clean housing, all those types of things to minimize disease. 
So this is a big misconception that sometimes people think that organic foods are pesticide free, but that's actually not the case. Um, you just have to do your research on where things are coming from. And regardless of whether you choose conventional or organic foods, um, our food supply in the U.S. is regulated and it is safe. Um, the amount of pesticides that you would have to ingest to be problematic would be much higher than, than the limit that is established. Um, so you don't need to worry about, about that, even with conventional foods. So there's no strong evidence that organic fruits and vegetables are going to provide more protection against cancer than conventional foods. There's been no consistent evidence organic food is any more nutritious. There may be scant amounts more of various vitamins or minerals, but it's, it's not a whole lot um, more than conventionally grown foods. So what is important is that I don't care if they're organic or conventional, but that you are eating not just fruits and vegetables, but a wide variety of fruits and vegetables because different antioxidants and different phytonutrients that are found fight against cancer in different ways. So just important that we, we consume a variety. Um, so that's, it's not whether it's organic or conventional. So some people do choose organic and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you can afford it, it tends to be a little bit more expensive. Um, even though there is pesticide, they are lower than conventionally farmed foods. Um, there's lower amounts of synthetic food additives, oftentimes better stewardship of natural resources like land and water, and also better stewardship of human resources. So more socially considerate of working and labor conditions of laborers. Um, the needs of the rural communities and health of consumers. Uh, that's not always the case. It's just, again, important to research where your food's coming from um, because some farms may, that are conventional, treat their workers with the mm -hmm. utmost respect. Um, so it's just, it's more so individually based than grouping organic and, con and conventional into two um, distinct groups. So again, I just want to discuss a little bit of what you might see on a label and what the qualifiers are in order for somebody to put um, that USDA organic seal on their label. If you see the claim that says 100% organic, that means that all ingredients must be certified organic. And so if that's just an individual product like a banana or an apple, then that would be 100% organic. But if you had something like a cereal or a bar, every single ingredient in that cereal or bar would have to be 100% organic in order to, to have the 100% organic on the label. Now, if you just see organic, at least 95% of the ingredients in that product are certified organic, so not all of them, but most. Um, made with organic, at least 70% of the ingredients are certified organic. Um, organic ingredients, less than 70% of the ingredients are certified organic. So it may just be that the product has organic apples in it um, or in blueberries, whatever the case is, but it's gonna be less than that 70% um, standard. So again, buying organic may, may be what you wanna do and it may make sense for you, um, but just so you know that the research does show that eating a wide variety of plant-based foods um, while maintaining a healthy weight, being physically active, being hydrated, that's what's really going to matter in the long run with cancer prevention. Um, if the higher cost of organic foods is, is a concern, you can use what I'm going to show on the next slide, um, the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. I'm sure many of you have heard of it, um, but the Environmental Working Group comes out with this on an annual basis, and it's just a guide, um, a practical way to buy organic or to choose what foods uh, that you're going to buy organic. So this is, again, you're going to get this slide, but this is the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And all this means is that the Dirty Dozen is going to have the highest amounts of pesticides, and that Clean 15 is going to have a much lower amount of pesticides. Uh, and it is, is important to note that this is just for conventional foods. And so you're not going to see organic foods reflected here, uh, because as you now know, they contain pesticides as well. So I can't tell you where organic apples are going to end up on this list, but um, this is just you know, based on conventional and it shows you what has the highest amount of pesticides versus the a lower amount of pesticides. 
All right, next topic is soy safe. All right, so most, just a little bit of background, uh, most of the research that has been conducted on this subject was geared toward breast cancer patients, um, not quite as much as uh, with other hormone cancers. Um, and the current consensus and research among the health experts who study say study soy say that it is completely safe for breast cancer survivors to eat these foods. And some studies are even suggesting that soy is protective against breast cancer recurrence. So not only is it safe, but encouraged. Um, and again, like I said earlier, there's less research regarding soy and other hormone related cancers. So your prostate, endometrial, ovarian, um, but the studies that are out there suggest that the soy foods are safe for these people too. So the confusion lies in the structure. Um, phytoestrogens is one term that you're going to hear me use a little bit. Um, some soy nutrients, the isoflavones, have the chemical structure that look like the estrogen found in a woman's body, but that's, that's not what it is. Um, isoflavones are not the same thing as female estrogens. They do bind to the body's estrogen receptors differently and they function differently. So that's important to remember that it's not this, it's not the same thing. Um, avoidance was initially recommended because there was a misunderstanding about the potential effects of phytoestrogens and hormone sensitive cancers. But here's the thing, most of the research was done in mice or rodents and they metabolize soy foods differently than humans do. And so the research wasn't even accurate or applicable to humans. So now we have studies of survivors of breast and prostate cancer showing, showing no harmful effects and potential beneficial roles as part of a healthy diet. Um, so in human studies, there's a clear picture that soy is safe and then a potential benefit is having soy as part of your diet. So the common consensus again is that soy foods are safe for breast cancer survivors. Some research is suggesting that it may even inc increase, um, I'm sorry, decrease the likelihood of breast cancer recurrence. Um, most health experts agree that the evidence is not strong enough to recommend that all women with a history of breast cancer eat more soy. So if you're not eating it now and it doesn't interest you, you don't have to start. That's, that's not what I'm saying here either. Um, to be honest with you, I don't love soy foods other than edamame, so I don't even eat it that much. Um, but it goes to show that if you do enjoy it, then you are you know, more, than, more than able to, to continue eating it. Um, but you don't have to if you don't want to. So several large human studies consistently show that women who do not, who they compared women who don't eat soy with women who regularly eat soy. And those who regularly eat soy do have a lower breast cancer risk. And then some studies also suggest that breast cancer survivors who, who consume soy foods have a lower risk of recurrence compared to those who avoid it. So studies have been conducted in both Asian and US populations. And this is important to note because as many of you probably know, soy has long been in the diet of um, Asian people and Asian cuisines, but it is relatively new to the American diet. These studies are observational, so it's not always possible that the true connection with a better breast health is not soy, but it's something that's related to eating soy, and I'll explain that a little bit in a minute. So it may not be eating soy in and of itself. And for example, women who eat soy foods may also eat less fried foods and more vegetables. They could exercise more, they could have just a healthier lifestyle in general. So it may not just be the soy that's being observed, the soy intake. So because of the concern around phytoestrogens and soy foods, some people, even physicians, have recommended that women that are taking tamoxifen should avoid soy foods. Um, and for those of you who are not aware, tamoxifen is a medication that's used to treat and prevent breast cancer. Um, they've been worried or concerned that soy might undo the estrogen blocking effects of the medication. Uh, however, there has been research done on the subject and it supports the opposite conclusion. Um, it, soy foods actually appear to enhance or improve the breast cancer blocking actions of tamoxifen. So it actually is good for tam tamoxifen. A review of studies published back in 2019 pooled 330,000 
human participants, and they found that soy protein intake was associated with a decreased risk in the mortality of breast cancer. So the only food or beverage that is of concern when on tamoxifen is grapefruit or grapefruit juice. Um, and I would just encourage you if you're taking any type of medication, just ask your physician or your pharmacist um, or look up whether or not grapefruit um, interferes with it because it interferes with a lot of different medications. So many resources recommend to avoid grapefruit while taking tamoxifen. I would highly recommend that myself. Um, there are no other foods known to have an inter interaction with tamoxifen. So people will ask how much soy. Um, I don't know a lot of people in the U.S. that consume more than this, um, but moderate consumption, if you hear that terminology, is considered one to two standard servings of daily whole soy food. So that's not the soy protein powders, which are also fine, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, tofu, soy milk, edamame, and soy nuts. So soy has seven grams of protein and about 25 milligrams of isoflavones um, per serving. And one serving is about a third of a cup of tofu, about a full eight ounce cup of soy milk, half a cup of edamame, or a fourth of a cup of soy nuts. Um, studies have demonstrated that up to three servings a day or even 100 milligrams um, of isoflavones consumed in the Asian populations doesn't link to an increased breast cancer risk. Um, and if you're wanting to start incorporating soy, you can start small. You can throw some edamame into a recipe. You can have a little bit of tofu. Try it different ways. Just try it here and there and just see if you like it. Um, but again, it's not something that I am forcing on anybody. All right. So, of course, the very common question is, what do I eat? What is the diet that's going to reduce my cancer risk? Is it intermittent fasting? Is it keto? Um, the answer is no. This is the standard guideline, and it's a really good visual that the American Institute of Cancer Research uses, and it's called the New American Plate. So this is just a really good visual that, that will help you with setting up your plate, particularly if you're new to meal planning or um, new to a more plant-focused or plant-centric diet. Um, Two-thirds or more of that plate is going to be plants. So that's going to be your whole grains, your beans, your fruits, your vegetables are going to take up about two-thirds of your plate. And then one-third or less is going to be an animal protein. You also want two types of vegetables on that plate because, as I mentioned before, in efforts to get a variety of vitamins, minerals, fiber, phytonutrients, antioxidants, we need to be really varying our intake. Um, and then that piece of meat's going to be about the size of a deck of cards, so about three ounces. Um, and I do want to note when you go out to a restaurant, it's probably going to be at least twice this size, if not you know, four times this size. Um, if you'll appear in 12, 16 ounce steaks, things like that, which are about four or five servings of protein. Um, so this is just going to be, again, a, just a very modest amount. And then this is another uh, visual method that I use a lot. This is really good for weight management. If you're either trying to attain a healthy weight for cancer prevention or if you're in survivorship, this is really, really handy and great to use. Um, one important thing to note that you can't really tell by this slide, aside from it saying nine inch plate, is this is about the size of a salad plate. This is not the standard plate that we have in the U.S., which is actually the size of about a platter um, that many of us eat off of. But this is going to be a smaller plate that's going to help with portion sizes. So if you were to draw an imaginary line down the middle, half of that plate is going to be a variety of non-starchy vegetables. And then on the next slide, I'll, I'll distinguish what's non-starchy versus what's starchy. One fourth of that plate is going to be your lean protein source. It can also be beans. Beans and tofu, tempeh, soy products are unique in that they're interchangeable. The beans can either be a protein, they can also be a starch. Um, so they can go on either part of that plate. And then the other fourth of that plate is going to be your whole grain or your starchy vegetables. 
Um, and then you'll notice that there is fruit as a source of sweetness off to the side. So that's more antioxidants and phytonutrients. So you'll notice that there's lots of color. There's a variety of colors. Um, so I really like how this plate is set up. And you'll also see the low calorie beverage. So a lower calorie beverage is going to help prevent that, that weight gain as well and keep you hydrated. So this is what I was referring to, the non-starchy versus, versus the starchy vegetables. Um, non-starchy vegetables, in essence, are going to have a little bit higher fiber content and lower carbohydrate content. So that's going to be all your green vegetables, as you see here on the left side of the slide, your carrots, cauliflower, most of your salad ingredients, um, eggplant, mushrooms, onions, uh, any type of salad, greens, tomatoes, turnip, zucchini, all those things are considered to be non-starchy, so they'll go on that half of a plate. And then your starchy vegetables are going to be your root veggies, your squash, your pumpkin potatoes, corn, green peas. Um, all of that is very healthy for you. It just goes on a different part of your plate. So getting started, I would say I get that question a lot is just sort of changing your mindset. And growing up in the South, it was always, what vegetables am I going to have with my meat? What, what am I going to have with my steak or my chicken? And so we want to shift our mindset to what type of protein source am I going to have with my plants? So plant foods first. We want to be plant-centric, plant-focused. I'm not saying you need to be vegetarian or vegan. I'm not against that. You just have to work a little harder to get in um, all of the nutrients needed. It's, that's totally fine as well, but that's not what I'm saying here. As it says here on the side, we just want those plants to be the star of the show and then the meet the supporting act. Um, we want to focus on a balanced plate with primarily those whole foods. Um, if you're, I know we're all really busy right now, holidays, it's, it may be hard to find the time to do everything from fresh or chop up fruits, vegetables. It is completely fine to use fresh pre-chopped fruits, vegetables, um, frozen fruits and vegetables, and even canned. Um, but I just want you guys to be mindful of that sodium content in canned foods. Uh, now there's a lot of sodium-free canned foods. You'll, you want to look and see that it says no salt added on the label. Um, because even if you see reduced sodium, it sounds all, it sounds healthy, doesn't it? Reduced sodium. And it's healthier, but that just means that that food product has to have 30% reduced from the original version. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean it's a low sodium food item. Um, but most fresh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that are frozen, unless they have like butter sauce or cheese sauce, they're going to be low in sodium. And so those are completely fine to use, and particularly when you're busy. And so just getting started off, you don't have to go completely change overnight. Um, maybe just incorporating a couple of meatless meals. If you like, can do vegetarian chili. Um, just lentils, something like that, once or twice a week, that would be fine. Um, and then just look at what you're, what you're enjoying and what your family is enjoying and just try to visualize and plan how you could add more plants to that dish. Um, so if you do omelets for breakfast on Saturdays, you could maybe add some onions, tomatoes, spinach, and jazz it up in that way. Um, with my smoothie, I like to do spinach or kale, cucumber, so that and my daughter, I have a three-year-old, and she'll actually drink it. Um, she's not a big vegetable fan right now, so I, I in my own life, have to get very creative in that way. Um, if you really like, say, rice dishes, like my husband loves rice, um, you can add you know, carrots, zucchini, and then just take out a little bit of the rice, and so you can kind of gear it toward more of the vegetables and a little bit less of those carbohydrates there. Um, and then I mentioned the frozen and the canned. And if you're just having a very busy day or have lots of doctor's appointments, it's just really great to go ahead and have some, um, some of those lower sodium vegetables or fruits on hand in the freezer that you can just throw in the microwave or whatever the case may be. So just transitioning your plate, this plate, start. this is essentially how most Americans eat. This is the old American plate, very heavy on red meat. This is eight to 12 ounce steak right there. So a lot of, again, that's three, four servings right there. Um, 
there's two starchy vegetables, so there's no non-starchy vegetables. We already know that's a no-no. Um, and so it's going to be really low in, in phytochemicals, antioxidants, and fiber. Um, so we want to work on transitioning this plate. And just remember that guide that I showed you a little bit earlier on. So this is what we call a transitional plate. So if you're not quite ready to go full speed, um, it's full speed ahead to the place that I showed you earlier. This one's a little better. We're getting warmer. You'll see that almost half of that plate is, is filled with green beans. So that's a non-starchy vegetable, but also remember we wanted two non-starchy vegetables, but we're getting better. Um, it's a little bit smaller portion of red meat. That one's four to six ounces as opposed to the eight to 12. So we're getting where we need to be. Um, and then that We'll just say that that's, I think that says it's brown. Yeah, seasoned brown rice. So that's a whole green there. So we're getting, we're getting there. So this is where we want to be once again. That's the new American plate. You'll notice that that piece of meat has shrunk even more. It's a leaner um, piece of meat. Chicken is a leaner, going to be leaner than your steak. It has more than two types of non-starchy vegetables on that plate, as well as some brown rice, a good whole grain. So that's where we're, that's what we're going toward. And with that said, we do not want your plate to be boring. You can mix it up. You can get creative. Um, this is a one pot meal here. This is a stir fry. And you can see that it has, it looks like broccoli, onion, mushrooms, carrots. So lots of different vegetables, um, rice and chicken. So um, this is the new American plate mixed up. So as you get more used to it and used to setting up your plate that way, you can definitely look into the one pot meals. And I did just want to show you that there's lots of sources here. So if you do have further questions or if you want to research yourself, I, I like to research things myself. I don't always um, believe what I hear for the first time without going back and looking at the research. And so there's lots of sources here. So when that is passed out with the slides, I would encourage all of you um, to go back and read and to see what else you can glean from the research. And with that said, do I have questions? Yes. We do have questions, Blair. Um, oh, sorry, did someone have, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, I uh, noticed recently on canned products, uh, it mentions sugar, but it also mentions sugar alcohol, and I didn't understand the difference. So sugar alcohol is going to be, it's, it's non-caloric, and so that's, it can also cause diarrhea too, just that that is a side note. And so that's just added sugar that's not, it, it, anything that says I-T-O-L at the end is going to be um, sugar alcohol. And so that's different. That's not going to be included in your um, your added sugars. There's no calories there. It's not going to increase your blood glucose level. It's not going to cause more insulin production. Thank you. You have a couple things in the chat. Let okay, I'm, I've opened up the chat box. Okay. Um, the best way to wash fruits and vegetables. That is an excellent question. Um, as far as just like canned fruits and vegetables, just grab a colander and you can just um, you know, rinse them that way and rinse till the water is clear. Um, and then if you're if you're doing a food safety diet, say you've had a bone marrow transplant, something like that, you wanna make sure that you're washing every leaf of lettuce individually. So if you get a head of lettuce, just make sure that you're rinsing that very well. Um, and then also something that I really like to use because I don't like soggy lettuce is a salad spinner. Um, so if you're doing food safety diet, you even if you get like a bagged salad, you wanna make sure that you are also rinsing that. And then you can use a salad spinner that's gonna help um, remove some of that excess water. So that's what I would recommend here. Okay, I'm going down through the... Okay. I jumped in right when sugar was being discussed. Could you repeat the foods that may increase cancer risk? Yes. Um, so red meat, more than eight to 12 ounces a week can potentially increase the risk for colon cancer. Um, also processed meat. So that's going to be your lunch meats, your sausage, your bacon, even things like turkey sausage that are branded to be healthier or not necessarily. A lot of times they have the skin on there as well. So they may still be high in saturated fat um, and alcohol. 
And then just in general, we, I hope that this came across correctly, but we don't recommend a lot of added sugar because it can contribute to weight gain. And that in and of itself, just having extra fat on your body can um, increase your risk for cancer. So it's not just drinking a Coke here and there. It's just having that extra weight on your body, which comes from consuming a lot of those um, types of products. Okay. Good question, Jim and Patty. Is it better to have cooked veggies or raw veggies? The answer is yes. Um, cooked veggies are fine. Raw veggies are fine. Some vegetables, are their nutrients are more activated if they're cooked. Some are better raw. So what I would say is ju just vary your preparation for a couple reasons. One, for the nutrient content and another so you don't get bored. Um, so I recommend both. I've been giving myself a break from really focusing on balanced nutrition during treatment because healthy choices turn my stomach. Am I losing valuable opportunities? Okay, I am so glad that you brought this up. Sometimes, and I'm not going to lie to y'all, when I have a patient on treatment, sometimes I have to throw my nutrition books out the window. And I just have to say, what's my primary goal is that my patient maintains their weight and that good solid muscle mass. Sometimes my patients can only drink Ensure plus, and they don't like the taste, so they want to mix it with ice cream. And I say, let's do it. Absolutely. Uh, treatment is many times temporary, particularly that chemo radiation therapy treatment. And so we just have to figure out what works. There's a lot of diarrhea, there's nausea, there's constipation. So there's certain fruits and vegetables my patients can't eat. Um, and so, absolutely, and nobody needs to be hard on themselves when going through treatment. It is a tough time. And even, again, even us dietitians, and we are board certified in uh, cancer nutrition, and we are, we also give ourselves a break from telling you to follow the American plate. But oils. Oils. Okay, next question. Um, olive oil, avocado oil, those are going to be some great oils to use. Um, that's what I recommend um, most often. Uh, but any any of the plant-based oils are okay, but the good omega-3s are going to be your olive oil. And then if you're cooking at a higher heat, the avocado oil is going to be really good for you. How about grapeseed oil? Grapeseed oil, yes, also. Good questions. Okay. How many eggs or yolks per week? So <laughs> this answer research-wise changes on about a weekly basis. I'm sure that you guys have heard one to two eggs a week, no eggs a week. Now research is saying that the dietary cholesterol and eggs that we're consuming are not shooting up that blood level cholesterol. That's going to be more so your fatty foods, fried foods, triglycerides, and added sugars. Um, so at this point, there's not a solid answer, but eggs are safe. I have patients to eat one or two a day, and I'm fine with that. Fish as a complement, what does that mean? I'm not sure what I said here, um, but what I might have meant if that, if whenever I said that was your protein foods are going to be a complement to your plant-based foods. And so instead of your fish, tur turkey, chicken, tuna, steak being that main um what we our main focus of the meal it's going to be your whole grains your fruits your vegetables is honey to be avoided with chemo not necessarily honey is an added sugar um it's it's that's one of those things where I say, you know, nutrition's on a continuum and we don't recommend a lot of added sugars just because it contributes to weight gain, but it's not because it feeds cancer. Does decaf tea consumption have to be equaled with additional glasses of water? No. No, decaf tea is, com is completely fine and does contribute to your hydration. Any food limitations or restrictions with anastrozole? Um, there are no food limitations aside from what I mentioned with the AICR as far as the processed meats and alcohol are concerned. Two-time nine-year breast cancer survivor. That is awesome. That is awesome. Very focused on nutrition. Good for you. Processed meats, I think I answered that. If y'all have further questions, just let me know. But 
without nitrates. Okay, either way, no matter what, we want to avoid processed meats. The AICR does not distinct does not have a distinction between nitrate or nitrate free. Tangerines interacting with tamoxifen. No, I have I have not heard that. I mentioned processed meat already. Yes, I'm glad that I could clarify some of these myths. That's great. Um, is tofu okay? If y'all had further questions, let me know. Um, one to two servings a day is fine, as I mentioned. Okay, honey is something with bacteria. You don't want to do raw honey. That's I see. I see what you're saying. I thought you meant in regards to the sugar content. Fiber supplements like Metamucil. That's fine. You can you can take Metamucil. Do diabetic medicines need special meals? Um, no, tip, generally speaking, patients with diabetes, uh, it, it is better to always pair a protein with a carbohydrate, make sure you're having some fiber and some fat all together in one meal. And your diabetic medications are just gonna be tailored to whatever your glucose level is running. But diabetic medications, medicines in and of themselves as a whole, no. Avoiding alcohol, is it safe to have a serving or two a week? Yes, that's fine. No, really, the upper limit of alcohol is going to be for men, two servings a day, women, one serving a day. It's better to avoid, but if you're going to have it, no more than that. Um, and that's going to be you know, one 12-ounce of beer, um, a shot of liquor, or five ounces of wine. And so it's... Um, it's not a whole lot. And no, you cannot save up all your alcohol for the weekend. I do get that question. Okay, so I got a question about unpasteurized. I would avoid anything unpasteurized, particularly while in treatment, particularly if you have low white blood cell count. Um, processed is going to be better. Oh, thanks, guys. Well, thank you, Blair, so much for answering everyone's questions. My Those were excellent final... questions, by the way, y'all. They are a good question. Blair, can you tell anyone, um, so this presentation, of course, is a great jumping off point, but if you're thinking you still have kind of some personal questions, Blair, how can one get connected to a Northside Oncology Dietitian? I am going to go ahead and put my email in the chat box and I'm fine if something else pops up later. If y'all welcome to email me and also anybody in the Northside Hospital Cancer Institute, if you're still involved in any type of way, we have registered dietitians at your disposal. You can email me. You can also email outpatient nutrition at northside.com and we will get you in the in the hands of a dietitian. And so uh, and again, everybody's different. Everybody has different side effects for treatment. There's, we have a survivorship dietitian who all she does is survivorship. Um, so you just let me know what you need and I'll get you steered in the right direction. Or you can just email the outpatient nutrition um, email. Either one is fine. Well, thank you so much, Blair. So everyone take a minute if you need to, to jot down those two emails. We so appreciate you joining us and everyone logging on today. I want to go ahead and if you want to put on your calendar on January 16th, Blair will be doing our next nutrition seminar on mindful eating. But everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving with family, friends, or maybe resting at home. And we look forward to you joining our other programs soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.